Hey everyone, welcome to another Market Radar podcast. Hope you've had a great week. It's been a pretty slow week in the markets. Uh, it, not much happened uh, in terms of economic news this week, in this shortened week. The NASDAQ is slightly down. ZB futures are also slightly down. And next week, we've got CPI on Wednesday, jobless claims, PPI, and retail sales on Thursday, and industrial production on Friday. So next week's going to be a bit more exciting. So today, we want to talk about the dollar, the US dollar, and what we expect going forward. So now we're kind of in a situation where America, the Fed, and other countries are at the end of their hiking cycle. What what does this mean for the US dollar? Now we're seeing Canada, so the Bank of Canada this week, they paused their interest rate hikes and we saw Poland cutting rates by 75 basis points, even though they're still at 10% CPI. So what does that mean for the US dollars? The way I see it is if these countries are backing out, so they've done all this tightening now, and they still have relatively high inflation, and they're already starting to back out, that's bullish for the US dollar. That's the way I see it. What do you think? Okay, so I think the first thing that we have to do with in terms of the dollar is dissect its composition, right? Like what is the dollar? The dollar is like a global barometer basically for um, how the world is looking at monetary policy. Now, that might sound pretty stupid, but all it really is, is this this idea that um, because you're the global reserve currency, if your central bank is not doing a good job, you're going to go and chase a dollar, right? And we saw that pretty much all throughout 2021 and 2022, like just such a beast move from the dollar. And that was you know, again, America was behind the curve, but in t- I mean, the, cent- um, the Federal Reserve, right, was behind the curve when I say America, but they were not as far behind the curve as a lot of other countries. So people demanded dollars. Uh, they were they were they had a more competent. They were basically buying shares of the most competent central bank. That's what it, that's when you buy a currency, you're basically in, in simplified terms, you're buying the shares of the central bank. Right. So when the dollar did really well. Every, uh, dollar did, did really well because everyone chased it. So now we're seeing the dollar bounce up a bit. And as you said, the BOC pausing their rate hiking cycle uh, five at, and they're holding rates at 5%, inflation's at 3.3%. So overall, that's not that bad. I, I know obviously Canada has a bit of a different interest rate dynamic in terms of their housing, adjustable rate mortgages and whatnot, but uh, they're in a real positive territory. They could pause. It's not that much of, it's not that concerning. Uh, at least at the moment in terms of Canada. But this whole Poland thing, right? Where Poland cut rates by 75 basis points to 6%, but inflation is at 10.1%, right? Now this sounds like absolute nonsense because it is, right? This is a political stunt. So if you followed or, re- or read anything on this or you know about the uh, the, M- the MVP, uh, there is an upcoming election in Poland and people are trying or the, the MVP is trying to stimulate the market for the election. So this is a great example of what independent central banks do not do. And this is a great example of why having dependence can protect you down the road in, in, in excuse me, having independence, not dependence, can protect you because the idea here is with Poland that they're going to cut rates, boost the economy a little bit. For the election and then most likely resume the rate hiking cycle, which all that does is basically prevent the, un- uh, you're basically kicking the can down the road, which I know is a general theme of central banks, but at least um, we can be thankful that the American central bank or the, the Federal Reserve is not that ridiculous. And obviously we also had Germany coming under pressure this week with factory orders pancaking. Okay. When I say pancaking, they legitimately were pancaking. 11% month over month. This is new cycle lows post COVID. So there is more deflationary pressures um, overseas compared to in, in America. And this is something that is going to reflect the actions of the dollar, which we've seen the dollar do phenomenally well the last two months, right off the lows, but it's still in a bearish trend. Now, why or what would drive the dollar further, right? So 
Theoretically, stage three of the compound landing is basically fueled by the economic phase of normalization, right? So while things aren't deteriorating fast enough, primarily due to the rate hike lags that we've spoken about in the prior podcast, people begin to second guess the recession and they get baited into the idea that the soft landing will in fact come to fruition. And this creates this basic drive for risk ap- uh, an increase in risk appetite and this idea that the economy will not break. We all know that cycles come and go and the, the compound landing will end in stage four, which is in fact the hard landing. The problem though, is for us to get there, we're going to have to price out the recession. The dollar going up is not that bullish for equities, right? I mean, your, your purchase, purchasing power is, get, is, is growing somewhat deflationary, right? If, if, you, if you look at it. But realistically, this whole move in the dollar can and still could very well be counter trend, right? Because we're not bullish trend yet. We're not seeing this type of concentrated bullish price action in the dollar just yet. I mean, we're, on, we're in a bit of a rally here, but this dollar is no higher than it was in March, right? So there's not much progress done here price action wise on the dollar. And that goes back to the fact that the rest of the world is going to basically bolster this dollar from taking off until there's this basic idea that the glo- that, that the world is in fact entering a recession, right? Because as real rates become more and more positive across the, across the, across the, the world in terms of other countries, uh, which Europe is still quite a bit away and Europe's a big, compos- uh, uh, it's a large competition of the dollar. But for example, as Europe gets closer and closer to zero and then positive real rates, it's going to reshore that currency. And what's going to happen is anybody that, that can get a positive real yield in euros would therefore sell their dollars and bring that bring those dollars back into euros. And that, that would put negative pressure on the dollar. So this idea of a global soft landing, it's not that bullish for the dollar. What we really want to see is we want to see a, somewhat of a, of, a, of a synchronous recession for this dollar to catch the bid. Now, we're not seeing that just yet. Obviously, Germany, as I said, pancaking their, their factory orders month over month, that's a start. But we're we're not really seeing this across the board in a, in 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 in, um, in a solid fashion, and I think that we're going to need to see that to really push things down. And obviously, the U.S. isn't going to go into a, a recession without bringing in another country with it. So I think that um, the U.S. remains more resilient, of course, given that uh, we were ahead of the curve. I think, and we have higher productivity rates and and, and lower unemployment rates compared to a country like Europe, right? We take a look at the Europe interest rates. They're not even at a positive real real rate yet in terms of policy, meaning the ECB is not even above the rate of inflation, which the Fed has been now for some time. So things are not as good in Europe, and everyone's always so scared um, in, um, in regards to deflation in Europe, right? And that's primarily driven from the fact that Europe has a larger percent of the population that's unemployed, and they also have lower productivity rates. So things are more fragile over there. Plus, they are basically managing a, a basket of countries off of one economic policy narrative, which, again, that we've gone over that before. That's just a disastrous um, combination of things. And I think that given Europe is so far I, or so, so much behind the curve, I think that there's, there's going to be this push and pull that we're going to see that's going to basically elongate the stage three that we're seeing here in the United States for some time. Uh, obviously, Things can break and when they do, they do quickly. But I do think that stage three will need some more fueling. And that fuel is uh, the the market's pricing out a recession, right? Is the landing going to be soft or is the landing going to be hard? Right now, the market's kind of pointing towards a hard-ish or harder-ish landing um, with the the Fed expected to cut rates uh, and the bond market in an inverted state. So as the market thinks or begins to price in this idea that we could stabilize at higher interest rates, the, rate, the yield curve should slowly start to lift in terms of starting to revert and, and basically normalize this policy, this, this new policy environment across the curve. And that will just put additional pressure on the economy. I mean, higher mortgage rates, higher car rates, everything, pretty much all borrowing costs go up in that environment while the Fed is still in a restrictive state and therefore eventually sending us into the inevitable stage four. Well, so but, I want to bring you back to uh, other countries. So like Germany starting to show deflationary signs. 
So if these other countries are entering deflation, wouldn't that be bearish for the dollar? Because historically, you know, a country entering a recession that's bullish for their currency. Right. Well, the same with America, right? When the, when America enters a recession, the dollar goes up. The dollar does really well in a deflationary environment. But what we have to pay attention to is the situation in Germany, right? Remember, they're not in a positive real, real rate environment. So everyone's talking about factory orders. Was this a fluke, right? Like we had this happen here in March. We printed negative 10.9%. And then in June, we printed positive seven, six and then seven percent back to back in May and June. So the question is, is this a fluke or not? Right. And the problem with this is to drive that currency move you're talking about, right, to get that recessionary action where you see the basically inflation falling fast and, and, and the central bank chasing it, you have this sense of base uh, of driving real yields further into negative or or down to negative territory, right? Because everyone's chasing this idea of slowing growth. Well, we've seen real yields in um, in Europe go the complete opposite way. They're, they've been rising, right? And across the board, across, across pretty much all nations, they've been rising. Um, and therefore, what's happening is you're not you're not in a state in terms of we can take a look here in, 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 in ECB that they're not in a state to draw back that to basically vacuum back those euros just yet. And that's where you're going to really need to see that euro move higher and push that dollar lower. But in that scenario, when you push the dollar lower, you're pushing the euro up because the euro is getting into a recession. Most likely the U.S. is going to get into a recession as well. And uh, typically U.S. recessions, no matter if another country is in a recession or not, will bolster the dollar a lot more, meaning the dollar can still go up. Even the dollar will offset the move from euro. So, so even if the euro enters a recession, it's still going to be bullish for the dollar. Pretty much, yeah. You'd have to run into a situation where, like, pretty much where Europe is in a light, real light recession and the U.S. is in a deep, deep recession, right? For that to, excuse me, for where, where Europe is in a deep, deep, deep recession and um, the dollar is in a, or the United States is in a very light recession, that may put some downward pressure on the dollar as, you know, 50% of the dollar index is euros. So that would certainly affect the dollar negatively. But all in all, the dollar will drive the risk off cycle in America, meaning if we are going to go into a recession where there's going to be a, remember, real yields, if, let's take a look at real yields right now, right? And let's see, real yields right here. Real yields are on a 10 year are about 2% right now. In a risk off cycle, what's going to happen? The reason why the dollar gets some gets demand or, or gets a bid in recessions because real yields compress, right? And yields in general compress. So when yields compress, people are chasing bonds. Bonds are denominated in dollars. So if they're going to drive real yields from plus 200 basis points down to zero, plus most likely negative, right? If they're going to do that, they're going to need dollars to do that. Now it all comes down to who has the best and most lucrative real yield that's reliable, right? And most of the time it's the dollar. You look at a country like the eurozone again they're they've been in, they've had a lot of deflationary problems over the last 10 years so the united states is in a better position in terms of i should say risk to reward right with these with the way the way that the amount of the amount that these rates can move so like if we were to look at what would have to happen here for us to get this deflationary or recessionary environment real yields will come down they will chase dollars. The dollar demand will drive up the value of the dollar because everyone's chasing treasuries. And therefore, the dollar goes up. And because of its link to euros, the euro will likely take a hit, even if the euro is in a recession. So how does all of this tie into the whole stage three and stage four? Like, what, what, is it, what should we be looking for to start seeing that transition into stage four? Right. So stage four is going to be the typical dollar bullish trend, bonds bullish trend, so on and so forth, gold bullish trend, right? And that's in an environment where we are in deflation or extreme disinflation, right? Rates are going down, inflation's under control, and growth is slowing. Now, the driver of this growth slowdown and, and basically compression in rates is going to be 
the effects of lag of the lagging monetary policy that are that uh, that's been brewing in the markets for some time. And this is a global phenomenon, right? It wasn't just America that hiked rates rapidly. I mean, we have the euro, the eurozone hiking rates pretty much the highest since 2008 in less than a year. So everyone's under the same constraint of policy lag slowly bleeding into the market. And I think that when I say, or when I said earlier, this, this idea of a um, global soft landing, right? Like this idea that all these countries can land softly at the same time. What I was talking about was this idea, and we, we all know that the that soft landings don't, don't occur. They, they, if they do, um, it's just because the lags haven't hit yet. And eventually the hard landing comes. So we all know this. We, there's enough studies on this. Long story short, Everyone's in the same boat. So everyone's looking at the markets the same. Japan, there's no risk. Japan's got an inflation problem, right? Their growth isn't down. Eurozone, it, their growth is slowing, but they're not really in negative growth territory yet. They're not a classifiable recession. So nothing's really bad. And I mean, we can look at China all we want. A lot of people are expecting, obviously, the, the China the data has deteriorated, but people are expecting to bounce. Long story short, everyone's on this idea on this wave train that the, we can avoid a global recession because. Global demand, especially United States-wise, like demand in, in America remains so robust that we could avoid a recession. And this will have to brew, take hold, and basically align itself in the market to the point where everyone's thinking, yeah, okay, recession talks nonsense. And it's precisely what that, it's precisely there when stage four uh, comes into play. And that's usually gonna, that usually happens at, at peak hysteria, right? That's why we said last week, equity markets could trend higher. Is it the right thing for them to do? No, not at the moment. But could they? Of course, respect the trend, right? Bonds. Could We do think that bonds have more upside from here than downside. But it doesn't mean bonds can't go lower. They're bearish trend, right? You have to respect the trends. The trends will drive the move. When bonds go bullish trend and hold that bullish trend, that will be stage four. Now, we've also spoken about the stage four integration, right, in the, in the last podcast and throughout our, our Twitter feed. This gr global growth slowdown, if it's mismanaged, it will be pretty bad, right? It'd be, it'd be, it'd be a deep recession. But the, the only question is, in this depth of a recession, are we outpricing what the market priced in 2022? If we're not outpricing that to the downside, we can hit stage four, a hard landing, but equities may not print new lows. That's something that we won't be able to gauge right now. Anyone that's telling you, oh, this next recession will be light or will be super hard, they're full of shit. Nobody knows, right? This is something that we know as, it, as the window is getting closer and as we can start to see, you know, take, take 10, 10 steps back from a window, you got no peripheral vision. Walk closer, you can start to see left and right. That's pretty much what's going on here. Um, anyone telling you what's beyond the window doesn't know shit. So you got to just let the, the, the cycle play out. And as we get closer to it, we can start seeing how things are progressing. Meaning, if growth starts really deteriorating aggressively, it's it's very likely that we can put in new equity lows. If not, if it's you know you're talking a sub um, a, a less than negative one, or I should say, greater than negative one percent GDP consecutive recession, right? Super shallow. It's not not going beyond negative one percent. Well, most likely um, equities wouldn't print new lows. But you get my point. Unless it's severe. Going to be, you're going to have a very hard time repeating some type of drastic event in such a short time frame that we saw last year in 2022. Well, so how do I we know uh, if if we do get consecutive negative GDP prints, how do we know if that's it or if there's a harder landing around the corner? Well, theoretically, right, bonds would lead the move as they always have been, as they always have done, right, in terms of in, um, positioning for the right part of the cycle. Bonds will set up, bonds will start moving. Now, the question is, is how the Fed reacts in that environment, right? And obviously how the market reacts as well. Do rate, does the bond market really start front running a growth slowdown or not? And that's going to basically happen simultaneously to the actual growth slowdown, right? Because the market's real time. It's not always right, but it's right a lot of the time in terms of longer scope, right? Therefore, as, the bond, as we go into that recession, the bond market will start pricing in um, appropriate actions therefore in terms of rates and we'll go from there now i can't tell you if it's going to be a hard you know if we're talking about a depression look most likely we're not looking at a depression i can just tell you that much and i don't think we're looking at 2008 either 
I mean, could we have some type of 2018 event again where we go down or even, you know, a, a higher low, like down here, like 12,000, something random? I mean, price targets were all random, right? Could we have a, like a second dip that's higher than the last one, given the recession isn't that deep? Of course we can. But you have to be positioned. And the things that will guide this, the, those, that whole um, concept of positioning are the trends. Trends are your friend. They will push you in the right direction as things move. You know, you wouldn't get, um, you take ZB, right? Or, you know what, let's look at the US 10 year because that's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit easier to see for those that are watching. You won't get to a 10 year at 2% and be like, okay, the recession's here. Like we would know much, much, for, much further ahead on the curve if we're going to a recession or not. Like we would know way up here at 3.6, 3.5%, right? So you're not gonna, it's not like we're gonna see everything transpire and then be like, oh, is the recession deep? It's once we get positioned for that recession, the depth will then be determined, which is why Aries and, and, and the system are great because they get you in ahead of the curve, right? Or they have done historically. And once you're in, you can ride it out. It's not that big of a deal, right? Once you're in there, you just sit back and relax. If it's deep, if it's hard landing, well, you're positioned for it. If not, Aries will likely pick up the positioning change and run with it from there. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't look, for, look at it as how bad the recession is going to be. I would look at it as when that recession signal comes, just make sure you take advantage of it. But I think that's where we can leave this podcast off today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter at The Market Radar.